I'm about to hand over to someone who I have always been in awe of. Um, I once watched her open a handbag and produce more items than I thought could fit in a handbag. I'm pretty sure at one point she pulled out a ladder. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to our space, Kate Fox. <laughs> Thank you very much, Owen. Thank you. Um, yeah, I like to be prepared. I know many of you will feel the same. Um, so I'm going to start off in this first section just by introducing a little bit about uh, me, uh, my writing, and and actually, um, so I'm a late diagnosed adult. Um, I was diagnosed autistic in 2017 when I was 42. Um, so most of my writing career, um, I started as a full time writer in 2000. And Six, um was was non-autistic um and I became autistic um and it's a it's a it's a process becoming an autistic writer but surely you are an autistic writer maybe it's not as simple as that uh, but we'll talk about that as we go along um anyway yeah so first bit intro and then I'll talk a bit more about um spoken word performing um I uh, can't remember the third section I'm sure my paper will tell me and then the fourth section is kind of looking to the future what is the future for neurodiversity and literature and performing and writing I, I think it's potentially quite a bright future actually uh, and I might just introduce you first of all to Joctopus um so he, he can be happy or <laughs> or he can be sad um I, I have a few little bits and bobs I'll show you not many um but um, see, he'd be a good Liggett skill, wouldn't he? Are you happy? Are you sad? I took Joctopus on stage with me the first time I went back on stage to do a performance after the pandemic. And there was, um, in a way, it was quite a moment of unmasking, in a sense, because Joctopus was functioning very much as a fidget toy at that moment um, and, and, and a comfort toy. Um, and I said that to the audience. That is not something I would ever have said in the past, but I felt like we were sharing a moment, a post pandemic world, the world's gone very weird. I can share my happy sad octopus with you type moment. Um, I just sort of realized I haven't done that since. Um, but I thought I would bring him for you. I'm gonna start with a poem that I wrote in 2005. Quite a lot of what I'm doing, by the way, is, is poems and bits of my writing. Um, and kind of talking around around them to hopefully be useful to you. Um, 2005, the new Doctor Who had started. In the first episode of the first series, Billy Piper's Rose said to Chris, Chris Eccleston's Doctor, if you are an alien, how come you've got a Northern accent? And he responded, lots of planets have a North. And I thought, flipping heck, that, that's my line. That, that's me, that is. Um, and I wrote what became a sort of signature poem, a slam winning poem back in the days when I did slams. Um, but it includes, so bear in mind at this point, I was not diagnosed in 2005. It was not particularly common for autistic adult women to be diagnosed or think they might be autistic. But it's got a line in it that has stayed in my work ever since. I wouldn't now use the phrase necessarily spectrum. Um, because we're in beyond the spectrum, aren't we? I'd talk about dimensions. Uh, but anyway, there it is. Uh, so this poem is called Lots of Planets Have a North. Lots of planets have a north, normally somewhere I have never been. You need a home to be an alien. Sometimes averages are just mean. I read Jane Eyre when I was seven, moved on to Geoffrey Archer novels by the time I was 11, never rebelled with drink or drugs, just Salvador Dali posters and ethnic rugs. Lots of planets have a north, normally somewhere I have never been, you need a home to be an alien, sometimes averages are just mean. I know I've got a distinctive voice, I just think it's cruel the way the word lisp has got an S in it, in a similar way to how the word dyslexia is difficult to spell. I've got two webbed toes, my eye lenses are rugby ball shaped when they should be round. I score highly on the autistic spectrum, which I'm aware sounds like an 80s computer that refuses to network with other computers. Lots of planets have a north, normally somewhere I have never been. You need a home to be an alien. Sometimes averages are just mean. I'm learning to play the ukulele. My relationship role model is Coronation Street's Roy and Haley. I've never had a one night stand or even a one night snog. I prefer to swallow rather than spit because then it saves wondering what to do with it. 
Lots of planets have a north. Maybe some of them will hear this verse. Because every Earthling is an alien to some other species somewhere in the universe. Oh, I, I could have got my Dalek out, my knitted Dalek. Um, so, for a lot of spoken word artists, um, they will have one or more than one identity pieces, I would say, signature pieces that say something about who they are. Before neurodiversity was really a commonly used word, um, I was trying to position myself on stage as someone who was um, not quite normal, uh, but averages are just mean. I suppose I was talking about neurodiversity already, preparing an audience saying some of the stuff I'm going to say may be coming from a slightly left field sort of place. I was also talking about my northernness, my accent, my voice being a kind of audible symbol of, of art difference. Although I have this thing where I kind of believe that if you're, well, actually I talk about it a bit later. Um, maybe harder to be read as autistic if you've got a northern accent. Other accents are available. Some accents sound more autistic than others, discuss. Anyway, um, that poem has served me well, continues to serve me well. Um, if you are more an on the page writer, then having that identity piece is, is less of a thing. Um, although it might still be important. I'm gonna put my knitted Dalek down. Um, so um, I do have a spoken word show called Bigger on the Inside, which explores autism, neurodiversity, um, my life story through the lens of Doctor Who. Um, I started developing the show in 2018. I got a Developing Your Creative Practice grant from the Arts Council, um, which was very useful and it meant I could afford to write the show and take it, try it out um, at an autism conference, at a literature festival. Um, and since then, it has featured in rural touring, actually. So rural touring, if you're not familiar with it, lovely thing they feed you so well you go to village halls you take your show they give you lovely food i can tell you all about the different foods i've had um that's a digression um really warm audiences you do your show uh, you get paid 525 quid usually um obviously the pandemic put the kibosh on quite a lot of that but actually it's two stints of rural touring I've done in 2021 and 2022 with the show. I then adapted it because I thought initially it was aimed at people who were definitely interested in autism and neurodiversity. And I've had to adapt a version that feels like it's more suitable for mainstream audiences. At the moment, that show is still in flux. I'm quite COVID cautious. I'm not fully out there in the way that I was before the pandemic. Um, I kind of wish I was. Um, Zoom is good, isn't it? But I would love to tour that show. It feels like my mission. It feels important. Bigger on the inside. The idea of like the TARDIS, um, autistic and neurodivergent people, our, our behaviours are not necessarily reflective of the stuff that's going on inside. So it's a very useful metaphor. And I'm just going to share an extract with it, uh, from it, about how I got diagnosed. And then I'm going to end this section and go, oh, any questions at this juncture? Um, and then we'll go on with the next bit. So, after suspecting for a few years and initially making a show about possibly looking into diagnosis back in 2011, I performed a piece at the Autism in the Arts Festival in 2017. And after an autistic performance artist called Annette Foster did an amazing show about the lost generation of autistic women and pointed out that my bracelet was exactly the same as the fidget toys we'd all been given in our neurodiversity friendly welcome pack, I managed not to blurt out to my GP that I wanted a diagnosis partly for political reasons. I imagined that wasn't in the nice clinical guidelines. So he had me fill in the AQ10, a shortened version of a questionnaire I had done online many years before. I knew I needed to get a six out of 10 to get a referral. I only got three. I took my pen out and annotated the little quiz, pressing down hard in my annoyance. This is not a suitable tool for diagnosing adult women with autism, I wrote in the top corner. It is based on a male template. In the question, I like to collect information about categories of things, e.g. types of car, types of bird, types of train, types of plant, etc. I crossed out the examples and put people, autism. 
I wrote along the tick box section alongside it. Many autistic women read a lot of fiction. Partly they are collecting information about people. See Atwood et al. Alongside the question which asked whether I find it easy to read between the lines when someone is speaking to me, I ticked that I slightly agree and added in cramped writing that I have developed this skill as I've got older because autism is a developmental, I underline this, disorder. I put this in quotation marks. My doctor got me to fill out another AQ10 with no ignoring of questions that didn't make sense, fewer notes and more lying. This time he was ready to give me a referral, but it turned out it would take 10 months to get an appointment with a diagnostic centre who I gather didn't have particular expertise in diagnosing women. So rather than take the risk of a process that might not be accurate, inaccuracy being a particular bugbear for many of us artists, of course, I decided to go private to the Tizard Centre at the University of Kent. After four hours of intense questioning about things going back years and having to make up a story when shown some pictures, basically like Donald Trump's indictment hearing, I was relieved to be told that I hadn't been imagining it. I do have an autism spectrum condition and I should be nicer to myself, the psychologist said. I thought there'd be a badge after my diagnosis, maybe a welcome pack with some earplugs and a fidget toy, but no, nothing. My then husband would easily have been able to find a support group to talk about how awful it is to be married to an autistic person, but there wasn't anything for me. I also experienced my GP's look of slight embarrassment when he said on my first appointment after diagnosis, I presume you'll be getting any treatment you need at the centre where you were diagnosed. I wanted to say, what, have you uncovered the world's only treatment for autism right here in Thirsk? But I didn't because obviously autistic people can't do sarcasm. So that is my first bit. That took 13 minutes actually. At this juncture, thoughts, questions. I'm not going to do the Liggett scale because I think I discovered during Owen's explanation of it that I'm probably dyscalculic dyscalculic is that a word anyway but you you can if you want Owen nice um I was going to say if anyone has any questions about anything that Kate has said to this point um could you just click the Q&A button at the bottom and just type your question there and then we'll be able to answer that um Kate I have a question I found it really interesting when you were saying about looking back at that poem um and seeing that you believe that you were actually telling people you were neurodiverse pre-diagnosis is there much of your other work that predates your diagnosis that has sort of clues or signifiers in it that's such a good question um because I, I was thinking about that I um yes I feel so but actually it, I, I think it would require a, a a slightly more attuned eye and ear to detect it so I've always I mean I love puns I love a pun I love wordplay um intense wordplay and a lot of my early poems the stand-up poetry stuff was was full of that and actually to me I can detect that as generally quite a neurodivergent thing but I suppose in the diagnostic criteria it very much isn't um I was doing a lot of facilitating of other people's writing, so I suppose that would have, let's say, masked it. Um, something I am thinking about a lot at the moment, um, it's my journey, my quest, and I, I, it's, it'd be interesting. I'm, I'm kind of glad we're doing a webinar because it's less distracting, but I'm sorry, people on the webinar that I that we're not chatting really at some point in a, in a, in a room, I think I would ask at this juncture um, how much people feel they are masking and camouflaging. Because I'm late diagnosed, I think a lot of my writing masks, masked, mm. is masked. And I would describe what I'm doing now um, and what Bigger on the Inside started the process of doing is unmasking, not only as a person, but as a writer. Um, and although I think there are increasing opportunities for neurodivergent writers, and that is really interesting, I think for some of us, one of the things that we're going to have to really think about as we head into a neurotypical marketplace is what does it mean to mask and not mask? And I just saw a tweet earlier, and I'm afraid I can't reference it because it was somewhere in a, you know, a long timeline of tweets, um, but I've seen similar before. Somebody said, um, you know, publishers 
keep asking for things written by neurodivergent protagonists, but then they get them and they say they cannot connect with the protagonist. So what are we supposed to do? I experienced that. I wrote a memoir because I had quite a... Uh, unusual story connected to my leaving home when I was 16 and running off with a gun runner and my parents being swingers, um, that sort of thing, um, which was not overtly a, an autistic story. But a lot of the publishers who read it, and I didn't, so I didn't know I was writing it as a, they were like, hmm, the voice of this, it's a little bit strange. Sometimes it's a bit detached. You'd think it would have more emotion in. I, I have learned, so I'm not, and I'm aware of the cliche of, you know, but actually, generally, I have tended to understatement in my writing, in my early poems. I, I, I think as much as anything, that's a Yorkshire thing. You know, you know show your emotions everywhere. Plus, half the time, I had no idea what my emotions were. Um, so my memoir voice was was not typically... Uh, it was not a neurotypical voice and, and publishers reacted to that. Nice. Um, you mentioned the show Bigger on the Inside. There's a question here that's asking if that show is available online. No. Uh, thank you for asking, David. Um, it would be... Uh, no. And I'm saying that like, oh, no. Uh, only because... Um, so, so many reasons. But I think for me, uh, documenting a live show is a really important thing to do. And this show actually of course for accessibility reasons should be available and uh, uh, eventually resources willing I will make that happen that's an arts council bid waiting to happen actually isn't it or well, maybe you and I can write that bit at some point soon that'd be I'm sure that'd be fine um and then also there's a question here for Ruth before I go to Ruth's question I'm just going to say in the chat lots of people are talking about sarcasm because you mentioned sarcasm in your thing I assumed that what you were saying was sarcasm yes it was. You were being sarcastic by saying <laughs> that people can't be sarcastic. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a little bit of confusion in the chat with lots of people uh -huh. saying that can be sarcastic. That's um, the irony, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, it's the beautiful irony. Um, question here for Ruth. What impacts did your diagnosis have on your writing and you, yourself? Yeah. Uh, if you don't mind her asking. It's quite uh, a question. I absolutely don't mind. Happy to answer anything. Thanks for the question. Um, I basically... I think talking about the masking is part of it. I'm going through this process of unmasking. I think for the first few months after diagnosis, I was quite angry. Um, and it was an interesting anger. I, I, I think it was a bit of a, maybe a, but I'd lived my life not knowing this, or I, I could have lived differently, or why did no one spot this? It was like a generic free floating anger. And I've known quite a lot of people post diagnosis have had quite strong anger. There was some identity confusion. Who am I now? And the anger came into that. I decided I was suddenly allowed to be angry in shops and restaurants. Uh, that was one of the, I was like, I've always repressed my feelings. That's because I was autistic. I'm, I'm gonna let them all out. Uh, there were a few scenes, a few meltdowns, actually, that I had not previously allowed myself to have. Uh, one in a pharmacy, uh, somewhere that I could probably never go again, but I can't remember where it is, so that's all right, uh, when I couldn't get um, some cream that I needed for my poorly eye. One in a restaurant when uh, they overcharged me. Um, and that's quite interesting uh, that um, I'm now doing Buddhist meditation to undo my newly learned ability to be really angry in public um, that was not the only impact but I, that 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 sort of stuff when I talk to fellow late diagnosed adults so and I'm sorry that I'm mainly talking about that they're my main uh, I suppose the main group of autistic people that I I know actually so it's um, your lived experience so that's yeah and it's my, yeah absolutely although I I now have got to know um quite a few uh, young autistic people, uh, 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 yeah, my mostly ex-boyfriend's uh, kids are all autistic and it's, it's so interesting to watch them uh, be like 10, 13 and 15 and be like, whoa, I, I remember that those life stages and being autistic in school in those life stages and I can see some of what they're experiencing and it was what I was experiencing but I didn't have a name or a label so that's interesting, there's that re-evaluation process. 
yeah, so it's still like it's, to me, it's a huge, it's a huge thing. It's a huge identity shift that I'm still digesting. Excellent. Um, that's the questions we have for this section. Oh, uh, oh, it's just a, a oh, thank we're you. getting a results from a, the psychologist tomorrow. Okay, exciting, exciting. We all want you to get the result that you want to get, Ruth. That's what we're all yes. hoping for. Yes. Nice. Um, can, I'm going to welcome to the tribe. Sorry. Go to launch into your second section. I am going to launch into my second section. Oh, and Annie's got an interesting point. Are the young ones handling it better then? Hmm. They've got more support available. They've got more surveillance than I ever had. Swings and roundabouts, I reckon. Um, so what does it say? Oh, yes, I see. I'm now going to share some poems from my most recent poetry collection, uh, yeah, which was published by Nine Arches in 2021. Um, I um, realise I haven't got a copy at the moment. This is the cover of it. It's a very beautiful cover. Very beautiful cover. Um, big thing for me to get a poetry collection published by a mainstream but not by a good a good poetry publisher because I have this uh, complex of oh I'm a spoken word artist and comedian partly and no one thinks my poems are good um, so I have to prove my poems are good and get them properly published loads of crap in my head that doesn't need to be there and um, but actually I did want to get some poems that were more about the page than the stage and I wanted to write about autism and neurodiversity and I don't know if I I did, I did, but I was very understated again. So I'm going to read some of the poems and I'm going to read a bit of an extract from an online review of the poems because I think it explains them better than I do. Um, I'm really happy that people have been in contact with me about the collection going, oh, writing from an autistic writer, that's good. And I wanted to do that. I wanted that visibility to exist. Um, however, back to the unmasking of writing. And I don't want to give any of you who are kind of going, oh, is my writing masked? Is it unmasked? But, you know, it, uh, you'll probably move between the two modes or maybe all your writing's unmasked or maybe it's all masked and fits into generic formulas and that's fine and good. But it's definitely part of my journey as a poet. Um, and I think there's a more unmasked set of poems to come. Um, OK, so, oh, OK. So I'm starting with a bit of the review. Uh, from uh, Diana Prince, who is a poet, um, and she was writing in London Grip. Poems like these are built cautiously, as though words are building blocks which can be toppled at any moment. It's a way of showing how carefully a neurodiverse person has always moved in the navigation of social relationships. When the poet person is also a performer, it becomes complicated by the distance between the stage and the audience, as well as between the created self of the performer and the real self hiding within. Um, this is explored in The Stage, one of my poems. And then she quotes, people who flicker like early holograms, who don't know who they are from one minute or month to the next and say things like, I don't always agree with myself. As Fox notes elsewhere, they wear the equivalent of masks, something now made real in everyday life, because these became pandemic poems. So it's called Masks. Here is a girl stood alone in the middle of a white aircraft hangar who needs somebody to take her hand. Here is a girl joyously kicking up brown leaves. People mostly see only one of these. Here is a girl wearing a badly fitting clown mask, plastic mouth rim digging into her top lip. And a girl in a lacy blue bodysuit, which raises a red rash on her tummy. Here is a girl who can make a room full of strangers come to hug her like their own. Here is a girl who doesn't quite recognise herself, though there are always plenty of portals. Here is a girl who became a woman who can see behind masks and round corners and hear the gaps between words and things where light pours like falling water. Here is a woman who knows she can travel as fast as rewind to where the girl stands alone in a hangar filled with the sound of arrivals and departures. Here is a woman who knows that it will never be too late to stand alongside the girl in the hangar, take hold of her hand and scream. And I suppose what I mean that, that to me, now I read that out, I, I 
in the olden days, pre-pandemic, when I performed a lot, a lot, a lot, I would have read these poems to death and I haven't read them that many times. To me, in this context, talking to you, it is so clear. Yeah, that's like a late diagnosed adult poem, kind of going back, taking the hand of her inner child, going, it's all right, just be you, you know, pick up leaves, sit in your room for hours reading and not going outside, whatever you need to do, it's okay. So there, there is a bit of an act of rediscovery going on. Um, in this poem, I this next poem, I compare, um, I basically compare autistic people to trees, because I'm excited by the fact that, um, trees we now know that trees talk to each other under the ground with their roots and I feel like so much non-verbal communication and understanding passes between autistic people or we recognize each other um I've got a friend who's undergoing a, a process of um a journey of self-discovery let's say she's working for a, a, an autism charity and she's like yeah well I seem to be autistic but I don't want to claim space that's not mine I mean I'm not really autistic I'm not suffering I'm not suffering enough I'm just not suffering so I'm not autistic am I and I'm like yeah okay but you you are autistic though and she's like but how do you know and I'm like well it's everything about you you just you know what it's like we have the radar sometimes anyway this is called what could be called communication you might find them staying near the walls or clutching their earphones, rocking from foot to foot and looking just above their audience. They might be wincing at sirens, saying pardon a lot in crowds, clutching the rails on angled walkways, wondering at the calm faces of everybody else. Sometimes they rest a foot on a crossed ankle in such a way that others will click love in recognition when one of them writes a Facebook post about it. They might have coloured lenses or squint perpetually into the sun. They think everyone can see the fluorescent lights humming. Their eyes dart or fix, so they might be called evasive or invasive. They're stroking a finger, twiddling with their hair, tearing up paper, something in a mesmerising rhythm. They do not always recognise each other. They were often to be found clustered around tea urns, outside where it's quiet, in the toilets at parties, in wombs and rooms where everybody shares the same nose because of those contagious genes. So they can per perpetuate their tangents and straight lines, build forests of themselves, sending micellar releases of carbon and water to those who need them, survival tips, encouragement, warnings, impulses of sound and light. Now, this is where I think my thing of understatement if I was to critique um could be quite a negative thing because really I I'm wanting to say do you realize world how flipping much artistic people are actually stigmatized how we're nine times more likely um to uh, attempt suicide to uh you know we, we die younger our health outcomes are poorer um but actually I'm just kind of going we have to pass survival tips to to each other quietly like trees do so I don't know we, we need very loud voices shouting this stuff and I feel like we also need quiet voices and that's okay and we need voices who aren't saying any of this stuff are just quietly getting on with being their neurodivergent writing selves we need all of it um I'm just going to do one more poem in this section and read a bit more of the uh review bit is this poem in one of your collections? Yes, all the ones I've just read in this section, Jackie, are in The Oscillations, the Nine Arches one, and Lily will put a link in the chat and in the end email after. Um, <clears throat> so a bit more from the review. The theme that links both sections is distance. The pandemic has schooled everyone in the necessity of social distancing, but for Fox, this was already a hidden part of her life. Before March 2020, she was already working on a series of poems about neurodiversity and how those with some degree of autism are separated and isolated from the world around them. Sorry, I'm looking doubtful. I do stand by that, but that's not necessarily the thing I always want to highlight. Anyway, standing two metres apart is how metaphorically she has handled relationships all her life, even when she seemed at her most connected in front of an audience. In The Distance One, she writes, I was always clumsy and elliptical unsure of the correct orbits. How close was too close? How far too far? 
doubts about physical distance are matched by an uncertainty about emotional connection and the rules that other people seem to understand with no difficulty. Within the family, she was the black sheep, the scape good, too clever for her own good. Her mother's lack of understanding was key to her troubled childhood. And this, then she quotes a poem. My mother was not patient about how clear I needed instructions to be. How much longer than for other people it takes me to learn by seeing or building up muscle memory. That's from Skimming, a poem about how far she and her partner walked while recovering from long COVID. This is a poem that measures physical distance and also how differently two people can perceive the same landscape. How much movement there is and sound, I said. How quiet it is and still, you replied. Yes, me and my very different uh, on off autistic boyfriend. Um, okay, I'm going to end this section there. I'm cutting down the four sections to uh, three executive decision and skipping in the next one straight to what I think might be the challenges and uh, benefits of neurodiversity and, and literature and publishing um, upcoming. But any questions, comments for now? Okay, okay. if you're skipping a section, that will still be in the end notes. So it's like a bonus. Will, bonus, bonus track. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> also, was the tweet that you mentioned from Joanne Harris? That doesn't ring about as in the Barnsley novelist who wrote Chocolate. And the Strawberry Thief. Mm, maybe. So that doesn't ring a bell, actually, but it could have been. I just did a little search and I have Joanne Harris tweet a uh, person complaining that they weren't able to identify with the neurodivergent protagonist of the Strawberry Thief because they are normal. Yeah, being a dick is normal. That's the um, truth. Okay, no, it wasn't that one, but that's interesting. So there's a very similar, yeah, thought yeah. and experience. Yeah, it's definitely the challenge, I think, going forward. Publishers are, are saying, we want this stuff, bring it to us, come to our diversity schemes, but don't be too weird or anything. Mm. But they, they also genuinely, I, I, but I think there's a tipping point and people are recognising that's different. Would you like me to read this question from Constantine so that you can respond to it? Do do, thank you. Okay. As you know, all of us here are the higher functioning, I hate that phrase, autistics, but for every one of us, there are autistics who will never say a coherent sentence, will never be able to safely engage with society without a, a carer. Do you feel that we who are blessed with the ability to write should give a voice to the voiceless. Because sometimes it feels like while things are arguably getting better for us, they are being forgotten. There's a lot to unpack there, Constantine. Um, a, a lot of what you're saying, I, I agree with the spirit of, of, of what you're saying very much. Um, and, and I think, you know, there was the recent Channel 4 Dispatches documentary about learning disabled and autistic adults be, uh, and kids being shut up in these assessment wards and that is terrifying and it feels like well we can certainly we should be highlighting and ampl amplifying that giving voice to the voiceless is unfortunately a fraught thing <laughs> very fraught lots of non-verbal autistic people are actually really in fact able to communicate really well in alternative ways and actually I think it's about helping facilitating them to unlock their voices i feel like owen you have done some work on this can i bring yeah, you I did, um i did quite a lot of work around uh non-verbal communication and generating poetic responses to uh exhibitions um yes. it was really interesting and really challenging um but it turns out that lots of people who are for, for want of a better phrase voiceless still have incredible ways to communicate um a, a rich plethora of creativity and ideas and it's just about finding ways for those things to happen i always think that it's interesting when we when we work with poetry that poem like stories need a narrative and need to go somewhere poems essentially you can just you can just give off a vibe and it kind of like that does the job and i think that we can we can create poetry in all kinds of languages um, there's a there's a, a an education system called the Reggio Emilia approach, uh, Sensory Italia. Um, it's a fantastic thing to do, and they have a, a key aspect of that is that there are a hundred languages in which children communicate 
and some of those are verbal. Mm, yeah. Uh, and that's really, and I think that sort of work is exciting. Um, I probably would, I, I, I suspect strongly, and I, I think there's quite a lot of um, uh, research beginning to back this up. I don't think it's, I think the purport, there are probably many more verbal autistic people as it is than non-verbal. Not that that's, that's just me being uh, quite... Sometimes just said that, she, that they are non-verbal and that they're not <laughs> talking about non-verbal. I think it's more... Oh, mm. I got excited then. Isn't it? I, I wonder then if it would be, I, th I think there's a challenge in, in trying to give, speak in anyone's voice other than your own, would, would be my response to that. I, and I, yeah, and I think we have a, I, I would say I would quite like to take on a general responsibility as a neurodivergent person to shout in favour of neurodiversity as a concept, as in the uh let us accept many different modes of processing and expressing and writing i think yeah uh we seem to have a few people agreeing with that okay and then some other comments okay do you want to take us into your third section and then perhaps we can do a slightly longer yeah, yeah absolutely and for every everyone viewing and watching um if you have questions as they come up if you could type them into the Q&A, that would be fantastic. But we'll also give a little bit of space at the end uh, of this section where, Kate, you can drink a bit of your tea. Uh, everyone can enter their questions and then we can do a little Q&A bit. We could potentially even put in a comfort break if that's something you're interested in. Ooh, I thought we've only got 18 minutes. So let's just plough through. Okay, Crack nice. On. On. <laughs> okay, so this really does follow on directly from what I was just saying about feeling like maybe, but only if, you know, I'm saying, oh, we, we have a responsibility. We don't, actually. Um, this is the exciting thing. Being a writer, you can be a right selfish person and just do what you need to do. Because in a sense, yes, you're connected to a web of everyone in society. But actually, something about being a writer can allow you to connect to, to you and your voice and then get it out there. And, and there's this irony that the more specific and particular you are, often the more universal it is, it can somehow connect to people and that's really powerful. Um, so not necessarily a responsibility, but I would quite like to take on a responsibility around neurodiversity. So at the moment, I am now hearing neurodiversity as more of a buzzword. Um, and I think there's a danger of tokenism because I think the Arts Council and other organisations have suddenly discovered it and they're like, oh, it's like the latest new thing, it's a thing. Does anyone know about neurodiversity? Um, oh, we won't have to say the word autism or ADHD or Tourette's if we can say neurodiversity, it sounds sexy. Um, I think there are some problems with, with that approach, maybe, um, and people not, not quite understanding. Um, I plant myself in the field of um, Nick Walker's definition of neurodiversity as a paradigm, a movement that calls for acceptance of different modes of processing. So there's a link to Nick Walker's work in the, my thing. Um, and they've also, she has also started writing about the neuroqueer. And I'm going to read a bit of a quick definition of it, a quick piece of writing that I have written connected to this um, and then I'm going to pause because I think this all is connecting back to my future mission of un unmasking my writing more and my performing and being maybe less understated about doing that. So the neuroqueer, okay, just like queer, the adjective form of neuroqueer, so this is Nick Walker, can also serve as a label of social identity. One can neuroqueer and one can be neuroqueer. A neuroqueer individual is any individual whose identity, selfhood, gender performance and or neurocognitive style have in some way been shaped by their engagement in practices of neuroqueer. Rega sorry, in practices of neuroqueering, regardless of what gender, sexual orientation or style of neurocognitive functioning they may have been born with. Or to put it more concisely, you're neuroqueer if you neuroqueer. What? A whole new verb. Basically, it's not about uh, being into the biological essentialism of neurodiversity or gender, it's kind of going, ooh, we're all a bit more fluid than that in many ways. Um, 
So, and I'm very interested uh, in that. So uh, she suggests that some of the ways that you, you might neuroqueer, uh, you might embody and express one's neurodivergence in ways that also queer one's performance of gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and or other aspects of one's identity. Um, you might engage in practices that are intended to undo and subvert your own cultural conditioning and ingrained habits of neuronormative and heteronormative performance. In other words, do some unmasking um, with the aim of reclaiming one's capacity to give more full expression to one's uniquely weird potentials and inclinations. Um, as a bit of a sidebar, I've just been uh, to a couple of shamanic dancing workshops where you're encouraged to, to move your body however you want to the kind of quite trancey music. And I realised I was un I was becoming autistic finally in my body and I was doing all sorts of movements that I'd never felt I had permission to do before because I'd been thoroughly drilled by my undiagnosed autistic mother um, in, in conforming to uh, the habits of quiet little girls and um, so swinging your arms rhythmically for ages wasn't really a thing how pleasurable it was um, sorry crucially point six missed some out producing literature art, scholarship and or other cultural artefacts that foreground neuroqueer experiences, perspectives and voices. Plus, point eight and beyond the spectrum is doing this, working to transform social and cultural environments in order to create spaces and communities and ultimately a society in which engagement in any or all of the above practices is permitted, accepted, supported and encouraged. A while ago, I wrote a thing I called the Quirking Class Manifesto because I've been interested in working classness. Um, I would say I am not working class. I'm basically in between, I'm lower, I was brought up lower middle class. Well, I was working class for about three years, um, but I was not really conscious during that time. So I was between not to three. And, and then I was lower middle class, mostly. Um, so anyway, I'm interested in class, but without knowing it, I was I was therefore interested in how you perform your identity in socially acceptable ways and class is one of those ways and of course um, varying degrees of, of expressing our neurodivergence are, are other ways. So here's the Quirking Class Manifesto, I want to do more with it because I've basically done nothing with it except put it on a blog, um, this will be my last piece of writing that I read. It's okay not to want what most other people want in the way that they want it. Applying the word failure is a means for some people to stop other people doing certain things in a certain way. Applying the word success is a means for some people to keep other people doing certain things in a certain way. Beware of any statement treating the concepts of independent or dependent as absolutely good or absolutely bad. You probably do and did things earlier or later than other people. Time is relative. We're all sometimes tortoise, sometimes hare. Your work may look like play and your play may look like work to other people. That's OK. The boundaries between the two aren't as rigid as society makes out. Working at play and playing at work is often the key to happiness. And brackets, really, that's, you know, autistic joy for me is one of the prime things that I would want to talk about when I talk about autistic writing. Actually, autistic joy. Um, you're right to be wary of the phrases. It's always been done this way just because and that's just the way things are. You may never feel that you belong, but there are lots of places where you can belong by not belonging. You exist in a place and a time, but there are lots of other places and times, past and future, you could live by. A community to value is one that values you. This manifesto could also be drawn, sung, danced or sculpted or signed. A translation of any communication or piece of art is always an act of kindness. Labels can be useful until they're not useful. Comedy lets you say two contradictory things at once and also doesn't. It's just as important to learn how to be listened to as to learn how not to be listened to. It's just as important to learn when and how not to listen as to learn when and how to listen. Finally, if all that you ever said, demonstrated, practiced, believed, lived, tweeted, skated, swam, ate, painted, excreted was that there are multiple truths, then you would have been kinder to the world than most people in it. I'm going to keep saying things like that more often, maybe more poetically. Um, right, 10 minutes.
let's chat. Amazing. Um, love your work, Kate. Absolutely love it. I myself, just in the conversation around class, um, I grew up very working class and I believe that I'm now middle class. I like to tell myself that I'm middle class. Uh, but I like to do all the middle class kind of things. You know, I have a, a log burner in my house. I've got a five ring stovetop. Um, I'm very much about having house plants and trying to be as middle class as possible. My brothers and sisters just haven't got the memo and are really trying to drag me back down. Um, and all the people on my street also seem to be very keen to point out that we live in a working class area. Uh, I'm trying my best. I'm absolutely trying my best. <laughs> it is an interesting discussion, isn't it? Particularly, particularly the sectionality within class and neurodivergence, I think. Absolutely. And I read a really, again, somewhere on Twitter yesterday, I didn't know I was going to talk about it, but someone had started this read about um, how often autistic people grow up with an accent a bit different to the accent of the family and the people around them. And it might be because they've picked that accent up from the telly and so may end up with a slightly transatlantic accent, actually, or from basically books pronouncing words correctly from, you know, from reading that, that was me, actually, and they might get called posh. And that kind of skews their class perception in a really interesting way. And I, I, I definitely, you know, I'm, I don't, I could, I love, because of the autism da, I could point out people on telly who are probably autistic. Um, and I, I suppose it's a bit rude to do that if they haven't, you know, but I'll just, on Gogglebox, one of the families, the girl in the family, I really like her, um, very sharp comments. I can't even remember her name. She's noticeably speaks more properly than the rest of her family it's not just for that reason but i, I read her as autistic and her, her speaking connects to that victoria corin mitchell being so autistic on taskmaster yeah, was, there should be some sort of commentary on uh, anyway uh bridget bridget christie on taskmaster as well demonstrating uh -huh. lots of uh yeah lots of potential there isn't there lots yeah. Of potential. yeah 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 yeah. Some interesting comments coming through in the chat. Does anyone have a direct question for this part? Would you like to pop it into the Q and A if you do? Uh, or a direct? I suppose it's generally going to be any final question for me about writing literature, spoken word. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm identifying with so Jackie saying about pronouncing words wrong because they only ever read them, mm. and uh, and then Claire saying hers was pedestal. Well, that's interesting. You, say, uh, uh, you, you know the spoken word artist polar bear yeah yeah polar bear um i remember maybe 10 years ago used the word uh antithesis ah and i realized i realized it was oh it's antithesis Antithesis. <laughs> but it, yeah. but it, was, it was a thing that he'd learned from reading yes and uh, for years i thought bit things were banal it's very banal that thing is very banal. I thought a lot of things were banal, but it turned out <laughs> all banal. <laughs> Damn it. Loving banal, though. Loving it. Um, oh, do you ever write flash fiction, Kate? There's a question here. Funny you should ask. Uh, basically, no. But today, I, I ran a workshop, an in-person workshop, um, for some poets in Newcastle. And I took in with them a book of prose poems uh, by a writer called Neris... Williams and it's called Republic and it's 75 prose poem pieces and I was thinking hang on for me I'm beginning to realize part of my own masking might be working in multiple forms there's a writer called Tanya Hirschman who calls herself a hybrid writer so there's bits of flash fiction bits of story bits of poem it seems to me that's pretty neurodivergent um so although I probably won't put myself in the category of flash fiction some of what I'm now writing um I'm, I'm writing something that might be like a sort of neurodivergent memoir-ish maybe maybe um probably are going to be in broader forms um good question here from Jackie uh how can we get autistic words accepted for publication by non-autistic agents etc I imagine that she means um writing from autistic people as opposed to the words themselves being autistic 
Yeah, I would say look out for these diversity schemes. The Good Agency, which is run by Nikesh Shukla, um, is a kind of diversity friendly agency. And it was started um, primarily um, looking at um, writers of colour, um, but actually is, is certainly looking at diversity more widely. Um, see, it's, for me, it's a bit different in poetry. A lot of the poetry publishers, I this is a great generalisation. At least three poetry publishers I know are undiagnosed autistic people. So they're like, oh, look, autistic writing without realising. But I think it is very different in fiction. I was just going to say, maybe you could meet an agent who actually is quite neurodagged and that would be good, wouldn't it? One of my favourite things about the poetry scene is when a poet says to you, oh, I've actually been diagnosed as uh, autistic or I've been diagnosed as ADHD. And your reaction is, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we all saw it. We all saw it. It's fine. Um, it's a question from Ruth. Ruth saying she struggles to relate, uh, read, retell anecdotes uh, and is really worried about her ability to tell a story or to link things together. Ah, don't, yes, yes, Ruth, don't worry. I am the worst anecdote teller in the world. I can't do narrative to save my life. And I thought, oh, I'll never be able to write a novel. I'll never be able to go on stage. But you can. To me, this is part of the unmasking. Find ways to do it that work for you. So, you know, use scripts, which might help you to shape an anecdote. But this whole thing of stories need a beginning, a middle and an end. The world is finally getting over it. Not... Mm the mainstream world so maybe this is more li literary world uh, but a lot of the world is so should oh yeah symbolism etc i would say experiment experiment and play uh definitely i know some artistic people who really enjoy having the structure the formula of having to make things link where usually they don't link it's like my head is chaos but look i have made structure that can be really satisfying or it can be really restricting and, and feel false. It just seems to depend on how, how what works for you. Try multiple forms, but don't worry, don't worry about that. Like if you never want to link things together, it sounds like you're probably more of a poet, to be fair. Um, There's also maybe something around the idea of just sitting in montage and all of these separate moments and separate incidents creating something bigger when viewed together. Absolutely. And the, the idea of the fragment in writing is becoming more popular at the moment because um, it's an element of trauma writing, actually, to write in fragments. So I'm now going to, I'm sorry, forget every book that I've recently read that had fragment elements, but there are several. Um, I could email them. I've, no, I've noticed it's a thing. It's becoming a thing. Nice. Um, we've got a couple of questions and we've only got two minutes, so I'm going to be quite quick through them if that's okay with you Kate. Um, have people's perceptions of you as a writer changed since diagnosis slash unmasking? I think maybe so but it's hard to tell because a lot of it coincided with the pandemic. Immediate uh, physical reactions were oh maybe I shouldn't hug you which suggested some perceptions were running underneath something. Um, I, um, I think so but it's hard to t I wish I knew more. I wish I knew more. It was a big risk big risk to come out but felt very important to do so nice um who is your favorite doctor and if you were to write an episode would what would you want to happen oh. um I, th I think that the question answers the question who is your favorite doctor is that correct who is my favorite doctor indeed who are we see what you say there who is my favorite oh, pun. um well it's a combination of david tennant and russell t davis's writing like basically although generally as a doctor sorry unfiltered coming into my head to sleep with sorry that's not what you asked Peter Capaldi um but his scripts weren't as good because it was Stephen Moffat um what would I write about oh I feel like I know this and I, I'd forgotten it I just, oh it did something about the um I don't know something northern we've had the Pendle witches haven't we have we we've had witches but maybe not the Pendle witches Mm, I'll keep thinking on that. I love that you asked me that. I'm going to keep thinking about that more. I would love to. <gasps> Maybe that's the fan fiction you're going to produce later this year. Yeah, yeah. Whatever they. Um, what's your opinion on autism and empathy? Uh, Deborah's saying that personally, she feels that we can struggle to read people's social cues, but can be extremely empathic with people's emotions. 
Exactly. I think we can often be. So personally, I am a mix and I see elements of this mix in many of the autistic people I know. So sometimes I'm super, super hyper empathic and walk into a room and pick up all the energy and soak it up and take on everybody's emotions. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so drained with all your emotions that I felt non-verbally. How traumatic. Um, and on the other hand, someone will be talking about, I don't know, the imminent death of their mother and I go into logical oh okay tell me about how you're dealing with that and what's happening with the hospital and I have no emotions whatsoever and I I enjoy being able to switch off my emotions and and get into a very hyper logical rational place and um, for a long time I had no idea half the time what people meant when they were talking about things I don't know anything that had happened to them and I've read a lot of psychology and a lot of books to try and understand so that suggests that some of my empathy was not coming from my direct experience also I think I empathize brilliantly with parents because I have dogs but I imagine parents don't think that's valid I'm, empathy. I am a parent Kate and I imagine that if I left my kids outside tied to a railing um it would probably get a different reaction to if you left your dogs there. It's true, but I wouldn't do that to my dogs. No. Oh, I would do it to my kids. So that's again how the difference is. Um, there's one question here from Annie that's in the chat, which is about how do you get poetry published? I was just going to say, um, all experiences I've ever had of this, and I work for a major poetry organisation, is that what you should be doing is looking at the poetry you like and enjoy, looking at that publisher and working out when their open submission window is and sending your work to them. Generally with theatre shows, with poetry, with magazines, it's about whether or not you fit with what's going on there. So generally, if there's things that you like and you enjoy that writing, that's probably where you want to submit to. Just submitting randomly to everyone is not going to get you published. Uh, poetry Review magazine, uh, we spoke to them a little while ago, and their editor said they have uh, 10,000 submissions and they have 1,000 subscriptions. <gasps> so 10,000 people are submitting to a magazine that only 1,000 of them actually subscribe to. That's not good, is it? No, more readers and audience. Um, and something else is to submit to those poetry magazines, um, even though a lot of people submit to them. I um, was published by Nine Arches because many years ago I submitted to their magazine Under the Radar and had poems accepted. And Jane, who is the editor of Nine Arches, has always made it clear that she really likes my work. Um, Jane definitely really connects with the work of neurodivergent people, I would say. Um, and Under the Radar is a really good magazine to look at and subscribe to. Nice. Um, Kate, I believe we've run out of time. That's um, how it, yes, it went so quickly, didn't it? I, I, want, I want to say a massive thank you to all of you for your questions and your chat. And I, I sort of felt, I felt you. I felt you. I can't see you, but I did feel I felt you. And thanks, Owen, for chairing so brilliantly and bef uh, bef before the spectrum, beyond the spectrum, uh, for putting events like this on. Really important. Nice, nice. Um, thank you so much. Do you have one final statement for us as a closing thought before we end? Well, that's no pressure, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Summarises everything. Just, I would say, go out there, be be loud, be proud, be neuroqueer, if that feels appropriate to you. Um, but, but actually, just play, experiment with this writing stuff. Sometimes you'll need to be a masked writer. Sometimes you'll be unmasked. Just try it all out. Be, but, but literature and publishing and performing and spoken word is a, it's a brilliant place to become you, to be the you that you are. You will find the niches that fit. Good luck finding them. Excellent. Thank you, Kate. I'm just going to post into the chat. Those are the two links again for people to fill out the feedback. It would be incredible if you could. Everyone that's been in this session could actually do the feedback, even if this is the only session you've ever been to. Um, I've also there, I've added in that uh, the tweet that I found um from joanne i've got the story about the youngest black cambridge professor who was non-verbal autistic until the age of 11 and at the bottom the flash fiction that you mentioned um just there republic oh cool. brilliant very good Thanks that's what i do Kit. that's what i'm doing in the background is every time you say a thing i'm trying to find it that's what's happening <laughs> um thank you all so much for being here thank you thank you thank you thank you um there will be more beyond the spectrum masterclasses so please do look out for it uh sean has also posted a link to the good agency that's definitely worth a little look at there um we'll leave the 
this open for a couple of minutes so people can copy paste those links. Kate, I will say goodbye to you and thank you for your time. Um, I'm going to come off screen and go and prepare my children to go to bed. Um, everyone else can do whatever it is that they do in the evenings. Nice one. <laughs> thank you very much. See you soon. Bye bye.